Hello and welcome uh, to Multifamily Live. Uh, this is a monthly meetup. Uh, we're virtual now, uh, but it'll be in person coming up uh, at a, in the future at a, at a two to be determined uh, pace and could be quarterly or, you know, we're working on that. Um, this is a nice uh, hour and a half we'll spend tonight. Um, time permitting, we may do some breakout rooms at the end. My name is Jerry Sanchez. Uh, uh, myself and Mark YC will be hosting. Uh, Jason will be joining later. Again, uh, please use that uh, chat and um, we are recording. Uh, so in case uh, you want this, we'll be out uh, tomorrow. Uh, today's topic is uh, due diligence. Uh, I'm personally excited for, for this topic. Um, I'm part of a group actually that, that's, that's working on an eight unit and uh, that's on the contract in North Carolina and our inspection is tomorrow. So I hope to be able to pass along some information that I learned today. I know Mark uh, did the same last week. So he uh, has a lot to share on, on that end. So our, our guest uh, today, Brian Hennessy. Brian has been in the commercial real estate industry for over 30 years um, as a commercial broker, senior vice president of acquisitions and dispositions for a major U.S. investment company. Uh, and I, he has run his own real estate syndication, his own asset com management company, and has represented a number of Fortune 500 tenants, including Bank of America, Walt Disney, and Baxter Her Healthcare. So with over 12 million square feet of purchase and sale, as well as lease transactions across the U.S. and more than 2 billion in transactions under his belt, Brian has built a bulletproof system for failure proof in commercial real estate acquisitions. So we look forward to learning from him. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over uh, to Mark, who will lead uh, the panel. Yeah, so um, you know, you pretty much did a great job there as far as introing Brian. Brian, maybe if we want to start, um, you know, you can start wherever you want, but um, maybe talking about a little bit about your your background, how you got into, uh, you know, becoming the the maestro of due diligence, and what you led you to this point. Well, first, I want to say thank you uh, so much, Mark and Gazal and Jerry, to, for having me here uh, tonight. It's uh, one of my uh, great pleasure to help people learn this and share my information, which I think is really, quite frankly, the crux of real estate investing. But it's certainly uh, the least sexy part of the business because it requires rolling up your sleeves and uh, hard work and a lot of digging and investigating. And that's certainly not necessarily the fun part, but it is a super important part. So uh, I can give you a little bit of context how I learned how to do this. After being a commercial broker for 18 years, I had a client who uh, in, wanted me to come aboard as his acquisitions and dispositions uh, person. And um, what ended up happening is I ended up going over to his company and it was fairly new. It was a couple of years old. And um, I thought it was going to be a natural slide just to, because I had been in the business for so long. And what I found out quite quickly is it's very different than being a, just a broker. And what happened is the first couple of transactions we did were a couple of large office buildings and the seller uh, was a Canadian investment firm and the vice president of the firm who I was interacting with during the acquisition uh, quickly surmised that I was not uh, an expert at buying uh, large office properties and uh, took me to school. And it was a very painful, humiliating, expensive lesson that I had to learn. And uh, when it was all said and done, I had decided that I can't reinvent the wheel every time I um, purchase a piece of commercial real estate. I better start keeping track of this stuff and, and writing it down and creating a reference manual for myself. And every time I learned a new lesson, I would write um, the lesson down and the questions I had to ask, the issues I had to review, and and it grew and grew. And over a 
Oh, I'd say a six year period really is we bought a lot of property, uh, 9 million square feet and um, in all different markets. Some, uh, what happened is as we grew, we the size of the portfolio and the properties were getting bigger. And so we really had to be on our A game when we went in there and we were buying some from some of the biggest uh, players out there. And I think I learned some of my best lessons from them because you would think that they would be the most straightest shooters and, and uh, would never take advantage of anybody. And that simply was not the case, right? So um, at any rate, it was uh, a very valuable time that I spent in acquiring that information. And the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate was never intended to be a uh, handbook for uh, just public consumption. It was really just basically uh, for myself. And what happened is I went into brokerage uh, after that in 2012, and I had been out for a number of years. And it really changed quite a bit from the standpoint is, uh, you know, the basically all the information that was out there was on the internet. Now, a lot of people didn't feel like they needed to talk to brokers like they used to. I remember it was, you know, you could go and knock on doors or call people up and they take your call right pretty quickly because if they wanted information, they would have to speak to you. But that wasn't the case anymore. So I decided I'd take my uh, uh, reference manual that I created and put it up on Amazon. And just for strictly for marketing purposes. And uh, so I could tell people, oh, I got a book on Amazon. It's for uh, investors. And what I found out is that people found that it was helpful to them. And that was really when things started to change because I decided, well, if it's helpful, maybe I should take this more seriously. And I created a, some stories in it, trying to make it more interesting and personable and um, got a professional cover done, put some reviews on there. And then um, that's when it took off. And uh, what I realized was I really uh, enjoyed uh, the fact that it was helping people. And people were emailing me and calling me saying, thanks for sharing your information. It was very helpful. It really helped me out. And I, it really kind of gave me a whole new purpose with that. And so I decided I wanted to start uh, doing seminars and talking to people about it. And I did a course online. And I ended up writing two more books about commercial real estate. Uh, the How to Add Value Handbook for Commercial Real Estate. And then the other book that I ended up writing was the Residential Agents Handbook for Commercial Real Estate because the one of the biggest trends I saw in commercial real estate as I was in the brokerage end was more and more residential agents selling commercial properties once they were put on a level playing field with uh, the internet. Uh, so that was kind of the context under which it all came about. And so I, I tell that because I want you to understand how the, the purpose of the getting to this point and sharing this stuff and really making it my, my mission to uh, help others with it. Because what I found out was it really is the crux of uh, real estate investing. Right? When you have a system, proven system, while conducting due diligence, you can do it faster, easier, more efficiently, and you're less likely to miss something. And that's what it's all about. It's reducing your risk down to the absolute minimum when you're, when you're investing. When your money goes non-refundable, uh, you want to be as comfortable as possible. You want to be able to sleep at night saying, okay, I did everything that I could do to uncover all the issues, the landmines, the trip wires that were out there. So what we'll do tonight is I obviously can't give you the A to Z 
uh, version of it, but I can give you some valuable tools to uh, take with you when we're finished that you can start putting to work right away in your uh, due diligence when you're when you're purchasing property. So with that, um, I will tell you that you know, we can we can do this a couple of different ways. If if you want to ask questions as we're going along, the audience here, please feel free to do so. I don't care if you do it in the chat or just you can. If I don't know if you can unmute if somebody wants that they raise their hand or whatever, but we can do it that way. But uh, here's some common mistakes that I see people uh, commit when they're investing. Uh, first one is not valuing the pro property uh, properly. And I know there's some standard things that uh, you do when you're out there looking in the market, assuming, let's say, let's say you're familiar with the market. Well, you've actually been looking at property, so you're getting a gauge as to, uh, you know, what values are. But rarely is a property uh, value the same as when you sign the purchase and sale agreement uh, and then you get to the end of the due diligence period after you've done your deep dive due diligence and you realize all the uh, various expense factors that have to be factored in because you should be doing your financial analysis as you're going through and discovering certain things that you're coming up with, whether it be the physical inspection or the list is can be big, right? Factors in the market, um, factors in the property, uh, you know, things going on in, in the surrounding markets. It, it just, you wanna know that when you get to the end, you've properly factored in the, the costs and expenses that you're gonna be looking at. And obviously it has to do with age of the property, how they cared for it, all that sort of good stuff. But um, very important you take the time and learn how to do that, do your homework. Not just sale and lease comps, but all the other metrics that go into it. For instance, um, crime rate. Uh, what is the trend in the marketplace? Is there any current projects coming up? Um, what, what's currently not, you know, maybe an escrow, but you don't know about or whatever. You learn that by just being in the market, talking to brokers, talking to other buyers and sellers. So um, you just wanna make sure you're dialing in, you know, what are the job trends in the market? Is it a growing market? What is a, a rent growth in the market? Uh, are there any projects coming online? You know, what is the, go down to the Chamber of Commerce, talk to them, what's going on? Are there any big employers moving out of the area soon? Uh, who's coming in, right? Uh, those are the types of things that you really want to uh, deep dive down into to see if there's anything in there that might make you uh, hesitate and say, wait a second, I need to take a, a harder look at that, right? Especially in markets that you aren't totally familiar with because our tendency is to want to just stay within our little marketplace, but uh, there's a much bigger universe out there if you're willing to go outside and uh, you can get some bigger returns too and get into some other growth markets. And, but uh, I'm not saying you need to do that right off the bat. You know, you might be better served if you just start out with your, some smaller investments in your backyard and then work out from there. But you might not have that advantage if you're living in a little town where there's not that much property, right? So you wanna be able to allow yourself the, that ability. And the fact of the matter is once you learn how to properly do due diligence, they can drop you in any city. And within a couple of days, you'll be up to speed because you know. And that's why I say the biggest problem with due diligence, people don't know what they don't know. 
right? You can just go out there, hey, I did. I looked, I walked the property. I looked at some sale comps, and rental comps, and talked to a couple of brokers. Oh, great. Okay, that's good. You know, it's a good start. But that's not really peeling back all the layers of the onion to find out, you know, where where's the rest of the issues that could be hiding there. Uh, the other big mistake I see people making is uh, not understanding the lender's underwriting. And um, what happens is they'll make an offer and then they'll say, okay, let's go, let's get going. And then all of a sudden, all these things start coming at them with uh, due diligence. And uh, they start getting stuff to the lender and the lender's going, wait a minute, we, we can't make a 70%, 75% loan on this property. Here's why. Right. And it's like, well, uh, that's I don't have enough to put more down. So now all of a sudden they were just wasted about your time, money and energy. Right. So you want to make sure that you've got a pretty good understanding. How do you do that? If you're just starting out, you start developing a relationship with some lenders so they'll be able to give you feedback on general information. Right. I've got this age property, this many units. Here's where we are in the income. Expenses are here. This is the game. This is the the game plan with it to to get it up to speed and and add some value to it. And so you'll get a pretty good idea of what the uh, underwriting the lender is going to look at when they're uh, evaluating it. The other thing I see people uh, do that really is. Uh, just an oversight that they need to pay attention to. And that's going down to the city and um, finding out the property complies with all the current municipal codes. And uh, that doesn't take very much. And you can find out a lot. Uh, things were done with permits. Uh, are there any new compliance issues coming up that you're going to have to put money into the property for? What kind? What's going on in the area? Um, uh, those types of things. Uh, there's, you know, sometimes you're widening the streets or the, a bunch of stuff. You'd be surprised how much things can come up sometimes. So, a trip down to the city is well worth your time and energy uh, to go spend some time and see what's up and pull the papers on them, have, have a chat with the people behind the desk there and ask them a lot of questions. Um, Brian, that question with that, uh, are there certain questions that, that become common with like a certain vintage, uh, you know, whether uh, it was built in a certain year or even certain part of the country that, that you, you know, tend to find that you have to ask these questions uh, that geographically? Well, you know, it's just, uh, that's a good question because yes, uh, there are certain areas that uh, actually um, have certain issues with it. Uh, for instance, if you're going into Florida, uh, they have sinkhole issues there. And um, that's something that may not seem like it could be a big issue, but let me tell you, it is. I, I bought a big property there and I had not purchased a property in Florida before. And it was just a suburb outside of Orlando called Maitland. And it was an institutionally owned property. And when I, uh, I think there was like 36 offers on the property when I offered on it and I flew out there and I met with the broker and I just said, hey, we're your buyers, here's why, blah, 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 blah. So we ended up getting the deal. But when we got there, uh, oh, he also said, oh, did you know that the property has some sinkhole issues, even though it's being monitored, it, it, there is a sinkhole issue there that they're, they're dealing with. And I said, no, I didn't, but you know, we'll take a look at that and we'll try to figure that out. It shouldn't be a big deal if it's institutionally owned. You know, they said, no, it's not. They monitor it annually. So we've got tons of paperwork and reports to show you. So when we started in on it, I found out that the lender wanted a uh, uh, sonar 
um, report. It shows what they do is they basically look for sinkhole issues with x-ray the properties essentially. And uh, we had that done and I sent it off. This was a big lesson I learned too. I sent it off to the lender and they said, well, it looks fine. The problem is this is not an approved vendor. And I said, well, they're highly regarded uh, company out there. I checked and they said, doesn't matter. They're not on our approval list and we don't have enough time to get them on it. So you're going to have to get one off our list. And I had like five days to get it done. So I had to spend another, I think it was seven or eight grand to get it done. So if you're ever here, here's something to mark down. If you're ever, if you're ever getting any inspections done on the property, make sure that the lender has approved who you're using first. If you don't, you may end up with the problem that I had, which was having to redo it off of their approved list. So if you're going to use an inspector or uh, if they want to, you know, that's one issue. I mean, there could be geology issue. Uh, here in California, we got earthquakes. So it's, we, we have seismic inspections, um, geology. So uh, make sure if you're going to spend the money to get those uh, reports done, that you run it by the lender, everything by email, not call them up and say, is it okay? It's send them an email, you know, here's who I'm using. Are you okay with this? Right. And if they give you any uh, pushback, just say, then please send me a list of your approved vendors. So, um, but you cannot assume that there's no issues with, um, uh, the tenants that are in there. Okay, you have to, once you've gone through all the leases, um, I'm really big on tenant interviews. I know with multifamily, that's hard to do, but um, I, will, I will still ask if I can talk to some tenants. I don't let them handpick the tenants. I just ask them, can I talk to this, 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 and this person or whatever? Because you'll be surprised the information that you'll find out, it's night and day when you hear from somebody who's lived there for years, right? Oh, this goes um, on. Is it all right if I interject real quick? Just no, please. Um, we did a, a walkthrough of a property recently about two weeks ago. Uh, some of my partners are actually on the call here. And our strategy was the very same thing. Working now. Where basically we walked through, uh, we had three of us walking through every unit, uh, one of us taking pictures, one of us going through our, our unit inspection form, and then uh, a third person actually spending time with each tenant. And, um, and that way, you know, while the property manager might have been occupied with one of us, you know, trying to show us the unit, uh, there was at least one person there talking to the, uh, the tenant. So that's a strategy that people can employ as well. Very important. I, I will tell you that I've gotten more valuable information from tenant interviews and I can at a, in, in any other single source. And we're just, we're focusing on multifamily right now. If we were talking about other commercial properties, I'd say, you know, it's the same thing though. If, if a landlord ever gives so much pushback that they just refuse flat out, you're not gonna talk to any of my tenants till I know we have a deal. Personally, I, I'll pass. Because the first thing I ask him is, well, what are you trying to hide? I'm not trying to hide anything. Okay, well, then it shouldn't be a problem with me talking to any of your tenants. You know, what's, what's the issue? Well, we're not going to let you do that. Well, okay, then it looks like you and I don't, can't make a deal. Sorry. Right? He's really not being a jerk. It's just being matter of fact, right? And if you're that adamant about it, then, and they want to sell their property and they got nothing to hide, then... Generally, they'll say, okay, well, you can only talk to these, this many or whatever it is, right? And usually if you're doing a commercial building, if it were office tenants or industrial tenants or retail tenants, then they try to negotiate, you know, 70%. And I try to talk to the bigger ones and the ones that are coming up for uh, renewal in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months. Right, just so I can find out if they're thinking about remo renewing or moving or what. But very important. Um, 
that's why I always say you want to walk each and every one of those suites. I think I, I you, if you read the book, you know, I tell the story about the being in the uh, apartment project. We we were looking to buy these uh, 150 units in Golden, Colorado. And it was an off market deal that I got from a broker. And um, I got him to allow us to start our inspections as long as we got an insurance certificate before we finished signing the purchase and sale agreement. And um, when I had the inspectors out there and they're going through it and I'm having a meeting with the property manager and the leasing gal. And he says, hey, can you come out for a minute? I need to talk to you privately. So, okay. And so I went outside and he said, I got something to show you. So he took me over to the stairwell and he had pulled back these boards that were at the bottom of these stairwells going down from the second floor. And he pulled them back and he showed me these cement footings that were cracked. And he says, there's a number of these around the property. <laughs> We're hiding them with this, these boards in the mud and everything. And I said, uh, when you're through, let me know. I got to go to the airport, but you know, call me when you're finished and just give me a quick download on what you found. And he did just that. And it turned out there was a bunch of them like that. And he said to the tune of like, I said, well, talk to me in dollars here. And he said, could be anywhere from a million to 2 million or more. And I was like, mm -mm, that's not a deal that I want to get involved with. As, as interesting as it looked, we were talking about structural and uh, I'll pass, right? You want to find out who's playing games, who's not playing games and, you know, just, you're, and that's how you do it, you know? So I, I tell you that story just because I, you know, there's, there's, there's a way that I was able to convince him to uh, allow me to start inspecting before we were even under contract. Cause he said, no, I wouldn't do that. We're not even under contract. So what, why do we have to spend all this money on legal fees? If there's a problem with the property, we can't resolve. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll still negotiate with you right now, but I, I'm going to be leaving in a couple of days. I'd rather walk the property and go through this process, process while I'm here. And he said, okay, fine. So at any rate. Quite Brian, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question on that? Um, how um, did you have luck kind of negotiating with sellers when you, you did find issues like that during the inspection and you kind of go back to the negotiation table and try to get something back based on repairs that you found? It depends on the, the size and the scope and, and the expense of the repair. Yeah, I've gone back and said, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this stuff and there's, there's a lot more issues here than I thought there was, but you, you have to remember something. This is key. Why bring it up unless you're willing to uh, work out a discount or credit or whatever the case may be and go non-refundable with your deposit? Because if I'm the seller, I'm saying, well, okay, what do you, what do you want? What do you, what do you say? What's the result of this conversation here? Well, you know, I'm gonna need a, $230,000 uh, discount off the price or credit in order to get all this stuff fixed. And here's my report. It's all line item priced out and everything, right? And so if he says, I'll give you 200 grand, you go non-refundable with your deposit tomorrow. Are you ready to do that? Well, if you aren't, then you shouldn't be bringing it up, right? No reason to bring it up. Why, why, why are you talking to me if you're not willing to do that, right? You don't so, want, to be, just, you want to be asking, I guess these are deal killer type questions, right? Yeah, right. It's just like, you know, so yeah, okay, you make it to whatever it is, 220, you know, whatever, it is, however you want to play it, right? I've actually canceled. I just said, nah, I'm not, unless I can get this, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Cancel. Sometimes two weeks later, you'll get a call back. Okay, tell you what I'll do. Sometimes three months later, they put it in escrow again and then the same, the next buyer had the same issues, right? And then I would say, well, okay, but we're not talking about the price we were talking about the first time. We're talking about a new price here. My embers have cooled mm -hmm. down, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So, and I, imagine, uh, and I imagine that you'd want to figure all this stuff out before your money does go hard after the due diligence. Uh, period absolutely. Absolutely. I tell people, you know, sometimes the best deals that you do are the ones you don't do, right? That you walk from. And that's really where, when you learn this stuff really well, and it's not hard, it's uh, the learning curve is quick because you, as you learn, you're just building on your previous experiences, right? And you get better at it all the time. At least you should be getting better at it if you're working at it. But, um, but you're able to quickly ascertain do I want to do this deal? Is it worth it? You know, uh, you know, there's more brain damage than I thought, but if I could get it for X, then I think it'd be worth it. Right. But unless it is, then why, why, why mess with it? Because usually what ends up happening is you start digging into it and it's not just that it's the other three things behind it that you got to fix and repair or replace or whatever, you know, can be opening up a big can of worms here. So, Brian, is there if I uh, just uh, put in there are a couple of questions here from the audience? Is there yeah. if we go through a couple of these? Um, so, Francisco asks, do you usually negotiate due diligence timelines or is there an industry standard? Uh, in terms of, uh, I think you mentioned, did you say in, inspection timelines? Yeah. Like due diligence periods? Yeah, due, due diligence periods is okay. So, it, it really depends on a lot of things. I mean, standard is 30 and 30 or 30 and 60 and just depends on what your terms are, right? Uh, sometimes when you get into properties that are really hot in a hot market and they wanna want you to name that tune, you know, uh, before you even pick you, right? <laughs> you know, I can do that in two weeks and close in 30 days after whatever, right? Which means that if you really want, if you really believe that property has all the eight out of the 10 favorite things you're looking for or whatever, that you got to be ready, willing, and able to pull the trigger at that time, right? If they pick you. So, uh, you know, but Depends on the property, the size of the property, you know, how old it is, you know, the big problem is getting people out there sometimes to just get the inspections done and whatever. They're so busy. It's like, you know, like I'll get out there and, you know, a week from Thursday or something like, no, I, I, let's try to get it done sooner. I want to get it done as quickly as possible. Right. So that's why it helps that if you can get a lot of this stuff done up front for your own mindset, and then get the other stuff taken care of as you're going along because you want to be convinced. I mean, the other stuff is not, not that it's not important. It's just that, you know, getting your mechanical, electrical, plumbing and all that stuff inspected is important, but it's less important than some of these other things, right? And so you just want to make sure that, you know, you're covered on that stuff, but 30 and 30 or 30 and 60 are probably, or 30 and 45. Um, if you can do it in less, do it to make it more attractive to them, great. But you can always say, look, I, I'm asking for 30. If I can do it faster, I'll do it faster, right? The problem is not, you know, sometimes getting a surveyor out there and whatever it is, you know, they're busy. So, at any rate, uh, moving right along here, um, we talked a little bit about um, these third-party reports. So one of the questions I get a lot is, well, you know, I'm a contractor, or my brother's a contractor, or whatever my good friend is, and, you know, I don't really need to get a report. Well, the report is for a couple of reasons. One is um, sometimes it's depending upon the size of the property, lender requires it, right? Your property condition assessment report. The other thing is when you go through it and you have a, a professional inspector go through and you want them to do a narrative, right? With a line item and say, this has a useful life of 15 years. It was, you know, it's on its 12th year and probably needs replacing soon. You want 
you want this information in there because if it comes when it comes time to go back and ask the seller for a discount or a, uh, a credit, you want to be able to say, listen, I've done all my due diligence. I've gone through everything. And based on my findings, I'm comfortable with most everything except these items, which I was not uh, really uh, privy to this information until I did the inspection. So in order for this to make sense, uh, I know you, all of this stuff doesn't have to be done right away, but these four things really need to be done. So um, right away, it's gonna be a lender requirement. So I'm asking for $65,000 credit to get these things fixed. It could be, and I'm, and don't, let me just say this about that. Okay. Don't abuse that or use that as a typical thing, because what'll happen is you get a reputation for that. Good luck trying to find deals out there because it spreads like wildfire that you're a retrader. I say, I will tell you this, it says it in the book. It says, I tell it when I talk to people, you're asking for legitimate legitimate discounts. The guys that really bug me are the guys that come in and just say, oh, I want $150,000, a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, that's nice. Well, you're not getting that, you know? So are there any more questions? Because if you're not, you know, if you're not prepared to move forward with under the terms we agreed to, then we're done, right? But it, it's, I always say, it's not, you know, what you're asking for, it's how you're asking for it, it really is, you know? If you come off as a jerk, you're probably not going to get much from people, cooperation. And also, I, I, I tell people, be, be ready to walk, right? Don't be afraid to walk. So, um, Brian, question for you from the audience, another one, if that's right. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a standard set of inspections that you perform on all properties that you're evaluating? So structural, mechanical, underground ground tanks. What, what are kind of the, uh, the go-to reports that you ask for, you look for in the due diligence period? Well, you know, I always get the physical, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, that stuff I wanna know all about. If you're buying class C uh, multifamily, then if you're buying stuff that's older, I mean, yeah, you can make money with those, but you have to be careful because um, there's problematic issues that come with those, you know, like the electrical panels, they have alum uh, aluminum wiring. If there's anything with fuses, sometimes you can't get insurance on those. It's a big problem. Um, so you need to be aware of those. Um, uh, they have single strand uh, aluminum wiring. That's a big problem. Um, the, you know, the capacity that's in there, the plumbing, if they have cast iron, if it's pre-1970, as those are issues. Um, uh, also, uh, properties built from uh, uh, 1980 to 1990s, they have the uh, uh, polybutylene uh, supply lines that can be a problem. And um, uh, so you wanna, uh, you want to be aware of these things. Make sure you got an inspector who's doing that, who is keen, who's really keenly aware of these issues. And, and so he can point them out to you and say, yeah, you're going to have to replace this plumbing here or this electrical here. You know, that's a given. And so you need to factor it into your in your financial analysis, right? And if you have that in writing, it makes it a lot easier if you're able to present that to the seller and say, here's what we came up with. Here's the issue, okay? Really want to get it done, but we're looking at another, you know, $35,000 to fix this issue, whatever, like, whatever the number is, right? So we're going to need some help on this. We, we want to get it done. So um, just, I would say if you got, if you're moving around the country and you're doing it, then um, I would say find your specialists in those areas, right? So when you, when you do find something, 
you can uh, quickly call them and, and uh, get it analyzed really quickly. So you can uh, you know, figure out whether or not it's something you wanna spend any more time, money and energy on. But um, let me just say this too. Um, don't take everything that the seller, broker, their representatives, whatever the case may be, is, you know, the gospel truth of it, right? You have to assume that those are issues. You need to verify. It doesn't mean they're bad people. They may not really know, right? But personally, thank you for the information. I'm verifying it, right? Uh, you know, just, but they're so nice. They would, they, were, they would never do anything like that. Let me tell you something. They, they, that may very well be the case. They might not intentionally do it, but I, I'm telling you, I learned the hard way and I told myself never again will I ever learn that lesson. I am. That's why I created the reference manual. And that's why there's a due diligence handbook now, because that was all my mistakes. You don't have to make those mistakes. You know, I made them for you. So just uh, take advantage of it. And, and you know, if I would have had that information, if somebody said, hey, these are all the mistakes you're going to make in the next six, eight years, whatever it was, you know, uh, but I'll sell this to you for $20,000. I would have said, oh, who do I make that check out to? Because there was a lot of headaches that came with, you know, and it was a lot more than that, believe me. But um, that's why I say learning this stuff will pay for itself exponentially. Just, it just does. Um, Another thing I, I see people uh, leaving a lot of money on the table with is uh, expecting the closing statement, the settlement statements to be without any issues. And, um, and I understand how that happens because you're so drained and wrung out from the due diligence process from doing the inspections and uh, doing your market research, applying for the loan, getting through the appraisal, you and you know all of that stuff, right? Raising your money, whatever you're doing, right? That by the time you're on the, you know, nearing the finish line, there you're you're kind of spent, and you want to kind of get it done so you can just start working your plan once you own it, right? But that's just the time you got to tap the brakes and start scrutinizing the statement because you're gonna find all sorts of things that could be on there if you're not careful. Some sellers are very adept at uh, loading up the uh, settlement statements with uh, credits for themselves, right? And you gotta question them all. What is this one? Why, am, what is that about? You know, uh, no, I never agreed to that. Or the lenders, you know, they got a, $8,000 uh, legal review fee of the leases. No, I don't, I don't want to pay $8,000 for that. That's not going to work. Worst case scenario is you can't eliminate it. I always get them to reduce it. Why am I paying your legal fee for that amount of money? That's I got to pay my own attorney. <laughs> I got to pay your attorney too, right? So there's so many things, especially if you're looking at it for the third or fourth or fifth time, all this stuff starts looking the same. The numbers all start jumbling up, and right? And I always tell sellers, hey, if you can't show me those lien releases or the contractors that were supposed to be paid, we're, we're getting the credit and we ain't closing. So sometimes when you put it that way to them, then all of a sudden the real truth of the matter comes out. Well, we have a dispute going on right now. We're trying to get that resolved. Well, then if I were you, I'd get it resolved or get ready to give me a credit and I'll resolve it after it's finished. You know? So um, just be aware, it, you know, that is such a key uh, factor is if you're aware of these things can happen, you're gonna be uh, more alert to them, right? You're gonna be looking for them. And I always say best thing for settlement statements too is um, uh, have somebody else that knows what they're looking for to look at them like your accountant, you got a property manager, if your attorney's good at it, 
have them look at it because they'll look at it with a different set of eyes and may see something you didn't see before. A lot of money can be made and saved if you, if you do that. Uh, another one, uh, and, and one of the things I got to say is, is check out your competition around your uh, property that you're looking to buy. I'm surprised at how many people don't necessarily do that because it doesn't have a four lease sign. You can still see if you can find out, you know, what are they renting for and what's going on. And uh, Here's another one is not spending time at the property. And when I bring that one up, I always get a lot of deer in the headlight look, you know, like, what do you, what do you mean? I, I was there during the inspection. I went there the first time. I, you know, it's like I looked at some units. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you go there in the morning, you go there in the afternoon, you go there at noon, afternoon, evening, weekends. Why? Because the property is in a, it's a thriving organism, right? You want to go through. So people, you're looking at multifamily. Drive the, the. Uh, parking area in the evenings. Why? Because you can see what kind of cars are there. You're going to see your tenants coming and going. You're going to see, it's going to give you a lot of information. Go there on the weekends. You can see who's hanging out front and, you know, doing whatever they're doing. You know, it's, uh, there's so much information to uh, pick up from that that people, they don't really realize. You know, I, I, I've actually passed on deals when I've done that and said, you know what, I just don't get, I'm not getting a good vibe off this from the people hanging out here on Saturday in the front, you know, drinking beers and working on our cars or whatever it is, right? So um, what else? Well, Brian, I got a question, because um, earlier you mentioned talking, uh, you know, walking the units. Um, first of all, you recommend obviously walking every unit and on that day, on that day of the, the inspection, um, you know, like what are some of the pitfalls and things to do? And also if you're planning on working on renov renovating units, um, do you just suggest bringing your trades on site with you? Uh, or, or is that something that, that may, you know, get things a little bit too complicated? If you don't know, it's a good idea. You know, if you're not familiar, you're gonna get to the point where you're gonna, if you've been doing it a while, you'll be able to ballpark it pretty close to what it's gonna cost, right? based on your experience, but um, I'll give you another little story. I was looking at, I made an offer on a large product, a large project rather in Denver. Uh, it was like 300 units uh, that equity residential owned. And it was a nice project. And it had a lot of, uh, had like seven buildings in this wooded area. It was really pretty, but I knew for a fact that the landscaping maintenance had to be a big number. And I said, uh, how many vacancies do you have right now? And he said, we have eight vacancies. And I said, well, okay, let's take a look at them. And so we're walking through them and they showed me a few said, well, that's it. And I said, well, I wanna see the other ones. And they go, well, they did pretty much like the ones we just saw. And I go, no, I want to, I want to see them all, all eight of them. She said, okay. So we went into them. Two of them were uninhabitable. One had bad mold damage. And the other one had been, had smoke damage and had been uh, cannibalized by, they took out appliances and, and, door frames and doors <laughs> and I was like whoa and it's like okay those are big numbers I need to factor into um, my my financial analysis right but if I had not insisted on walking all of them I would have never known that right so I, I tell you that story just to underscore the fact that just because you're big companies doesn't mean that they're not trying to, uh, you know, show all of the warts and everything. You know what I mean? 
They're not coming to you with a list of issues and saying, here's all our problems right here. Just so make sure you look for them. You know, you got to find them, but that's how you do it. And how, how do you do that? Assume nothing, assume nothing. You really have to be on your game, learn this stuff. How do you learn it? You can read my book, take my course. Uh, there's other information out there that you can, uh, other people have good, good courses too. Neil Bawa has a really good course, multifamilyu.com. He's one of the best out there. Joe Fairless has great stuff. He's got a great syndication book. Um, there's just really good information out there, but you just learn it. Just make it, you know, when you think about it, if you just put the time and energy into learning this stuff, it will pay for itself many, many, many times over, many times over. And you're going to just be a better investor. You're just going to, you'll be more confident. You'll be more um, sleep better at night when you're <laughs> investing your money or, or your investor's money. Right. Cause you know, Hey, I, I went through everything with a fine tooth comb. I, I know it. And, and the other big benefit is once you know it and you're talking to the brokers and the sellers is they know that you know it and they won't play games with you. It's like, wait a second, pal, time out. That's not how it works. Okay. And it's not being a jerk. I, when I say that doesn't mean don't come off cocky or <laughs> you know, maybe that's the New Jersey part of me that <laughs> comes out, but it's not meant to be that, you know, that's, you know, it, it's, it's the, um, it's just being confident about it, you know, because you know, you know, you know, and when you know, you know, you come off it. Hey, you know, it's only a good deal if it's a good deal for everybody. And I truly believe that if you're trying to get the last nickel out of somebody and, you know, gouge them for this, forget it. You know, people, their detectors are way too keen for that stuff now, right? They know when you got dollar signs in your eyes and you're trying to, you know, go after the, the last dollar in the transaction, right? You know, and that brings me to this, this point here is uh, when people ask me, you know, what is the most important part that I need to know about investing with this commercial real estate stuff? And I always tell them, hey, it's about love and service. And that's really what it's about. Okay, and when they look at me like love and service, what does that have to do? It has everything to do with it, okay? Because when you approach people and you're doing your business that way, you're serving God by serving other people, you're going to get help. You will, if you're doing your part, don't worry about him. He'll do his part. You have to do the best that you can and treat people fairly. And if you do that, you'll end up being treated fairly. It doesn't mean to say you don't look out. I just got through speaking about an hour about how you need to be careful. Right. And that's not, that's just being prudent, right? That's just looking out for your, uh, your best interest and your investors' best interest. And uh, you will be amazed just uh, how much more clear things come across. And uh, it's just, it's just make that your pole star and you'll be amazed about how things work out. I, I truly believe that. Why do I know that? And why do I say that? Because I know it for a fact, because that's the way it's worked for me. So I'm speaking from experience. Great. Right, and that point's really well made in terms of the difference there between being prudent. And I definitely agree with this. Uh, there's a difference between being prudent and being uh, difficult to deal with. And in commercial multifamily real estate, this is, you know, we're playing the long game. Whether or not we recognize it, we're all playing the long game. So it's really important that you approach these transactions and these relationships with that in mind. You know, you don't want to be nitpicking. You don't want to be difficult to do business with because guess what? That owner may own other buildings, other assets elsewhere. Um, that broker may not want to do business with you. Um, the trades that you're using may, you know, may not want to work for you anymore. Um, so it definitely is, you know, a business where your reputation follows you. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're obviously protecting your interests and your investors' interests. But first and foremost, you want to be easy to, to, to do business with. Right. If you do that, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I used to fly around the country doing deals 
with uh, we own properties in Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Florida, Arizona, California. And I was always amazed that if I'd go to sit down with somebody in Chicago, let's say, and start talking to them about, oh, we know so-and-so in uh, LA, we did some business with or whatever. And, and then all of a sudden somebody else's name would come and they go, no, that never going to do business with that person. Just heard nothing but bad things about them, you know? And it's like, wow, what a small little <laughs> uh, universe that we work in, right? It just, your reputation precedes you. That's why I told, you know, the guys coming into the business, like it's sacred, it's sacred. And one deal will tear it down. And you don't want that. You wanna be that person who, when they mention your name and other people know, they go, oh yeah, no, they're fair, they're really fair people to work with and really enjoyed, you know, dealing with them. and. They're straight shooters. That's the reputation you want to get out there. Then you'll have more business than you know what to do with. That's why I still, I always uh, amazes me when people try to go around and, and the brokers and stuff like that. I said, you're stepping over the dollar to pick up the nickel. What are you doing that for? You know, that these are the people that are, uh, you know, are the lifeblood of the business and they all talk with each other. 20% of the people are doing 80% of the transactions. You don't want to get on the wrong end of that equation, right? You can imagine as you get up the ladder to the higher price properties, when you're talking about hundreds of millions, okay? That's rarefied air, okay? And let me tell you, that little circle, super small, super small. People know everybody up there. That's why you don't, if you, if and when you aspire to get to that point, you don't want to have, you'll get there much quicker if you're a straight shooter, right? And then when you have the reputation of being somebody that, hey, they do what they say they're going to do, right? Then that's, it's huge. But you don't realize that until you're up there and you're, you're seeing it and experiencing it. It's like, whoa. It's powerful and it works. Same on the lower level price and even more so as you're going up, even more important, but it's important all the time. Does anybody have any questions for me in terms of any specifics or? No, okay. Not, we're gonna jump in uh, and you know, feel free because I know you, you gave us an hour and I appreciate it, it was awesome, thank you. Sure. Uh, pleasure we're going to do a uh, networking breakout room uh break it up into groups of four or five so uh you know appreciate you hanging on and um yeah let me just add one thing if you don't mind uh jerry so um for anybody that's interested i know there are a couple of people in here asking about resources websites um you know as someone who's read brian's book done his course i will absolutely vouch for the fact that it was worth you know probably hundreds of times what um i paid for it so um, we'll post some of those resources here um, for anybody who is looking or is a, a current multifamily investor and is looking to beef up their due diligence uh, process, that these are invaluable resources. I mean, the more uh, risk that you can mitigate and limit going into the deal, the better you're going to be and the better your investor is going to be. I, I always find it funny how many underwriting courses there are, how many courses there are on, um, you know, looking into the local dynamics in a market, but there's not too much out there in terms of guidance for due diligence. And as we heard from Brian, you know, he's had to learn a lot of these hard lessons over the course of a career. So if you can pick up this book and, you know, take that and, and use that in your process, it'll save you a ton of time, a ton of headaches. So yeah, um, I, appreciate, we'll that. I appreciate that, Mark. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll tell you something, it'll cut years off your learning curve. If you just learn the stuff now going in. But if you uh, if you want to take the course, uh, you can get a twenty percent discount. Yes. Uh, the code DDHB for due diligence handbook and the numbers twenty two zero. And you'll get a twenty percent discount. You, you got to go to uh, uh, impactcoachingsystems.com forward slash courses. And then uh, it'll take you there and 
And then if, like, like Mark said, if, if you, if you don't think the course is worth at least 10 times what you paid, if I, when I tell people it's probably worth a hundred times or more, I know that for a fact, but it sounds like hyperbole. It is, <laughs> but if you don't think it's worth at least 10 times what you paid for it, just send me an email. I'll give you your money back. I won't even ask you a question about it. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing too about it is, you know, we, we talked earlier about you have typically 30 days to do all this work and it's, it's a lot. And not just are you doing due diligence, but you're talking to attorneys, you're making sure all the legal docs are prepped, you're maybe raising capital from investors. So there's a lot going on during those 30 days. You want to make sure that your process is absolutely buttoned up going into due diligence. So you know exactly what you have to get done and, and you hit the ground running. And so that's why I feel like having somebody who's created a tailor-made kind of uh, process for you it'll save you a ton of headaches down the road. There's a ton of resources on there too, that you can use forms. There's a checklist. I've got a, I've got a 14 page due diligence checklist. I think is probably the best one I've ever come across in my career. It covers more things than you'll probably ever do from development to, I mean, it just kind of covers the gamut. And uh, a lot of sample forms and action items and things that, it walks you through uh, that really, by the time you get through it and you've gone through all the materials and everything, you're going to be looking at it very, looking at real estate investments very differently. You're going to feel much more confident and you're going to come off much more confident when you're talking to people. So you, uh, you may want to consider that. It's, to me, it's probably one of the best investments you can make in real estate is by learning this stuff. So. And with that, I want to thank you all uh, again for taking the time to hear what I had to say. I, I wish you all the best in your commercial real estate and God bless you all. And uh, I hope you make a ton of money and not a ton of mistakes when you're out there, but you will make some mistakes. That's part of the, part of the game out there, but thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thanks so much.